Hello, I'm Pradeep Khosla, Chancellor of UC San Diego, and welcome to the Women in Leadership Conversation here at UC San Diego. This annual event honors Dr. Sally Ride, the first American woman to enter space and a former professor of physics here at UC San Diego. We are proud to continue Dr. Ride's legacy, which includes co-founding the youth education program known as Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego, and this was done more than two decades ago. This afternoon's event is a candid conversation with four influential leaders and mentors in their respective fields of journalism, science, Latinx culture, and feminist academia. These four women have shattered barriers, and they have led the way for women in their fields. They are here to talk today about their journeys. Dr. Ride often repeated the phrase, you can't be what you cannot see, and I could not agree more. Since I arrived at UC San Diego, my goal has been to increase the number of women in faculty and senior leadership roles at UC San Diego. We have made a conscious effort to search wider and look closer at all of our candidate pools, and this has made a very big difference. Today, four of our seven college provosts are women, seven of 14 deans are women, and 10 of 17 cabinet members are women. And since 2014, the number of women in ladder rank faculty and teaching professors has increased by 37%, outpacing the overall growth of faculty. Today, women occupy 52% of management and senior professional roles and 63% of all senior leadership roles. And this isn't just about number of women in leadership here on our, on our campus. Dr. Wright would want us to create a more equitable environment for women in leadership everywhere. We cannot do that without focusing squarely on the problem and discussing it openly. To that purpose, I'd like to thank our panelists for sharing their achievements and their struggles with us today. Thank you all for joining us and welcome. Hello, I'm Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons. Welcome to the 2021 Women in Leadership event founded by Sally Ride's life partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy, to encourage women to pursue leadership roles. This annual program brings together a diverse group of trailblazing women who broke through barriers to become leaders in their fields and to pave the way for other women. Hearing the personal stories and reflections of these role models reminds us that we have a long way to go, but also that there is hope for the future. I am honored to be part of a university community where so many Tritons mentor, support, and champion the fair treatment of women scholars and educators. In fact, UC San Diego ranked fifth among education institutions, second among higher education institutions, and number 46 across all industries on the Forbes 2020 list of America's best employers for women. UC San Diego is also home to some of my own personal heroes, like Sally Ride, whose legacy lives on here in many different ways, not only through the students she taught and mentored who have gone on to become change makers in their own right, but also through landmarks such as the U.S. Navy research vessel named in her honor, as well as scholarships and fellowships and educational programs. This year, in fact, marks the 20th anniversary of Sally Ride Science, a program that Sally Ride and Tam O'Shaughnessy co-founded with colleagues here at UC San Diego to promote equity and inclusion for all students in STEM studies and careers. We're doing our part here at the university and in our local communities to challenge longstanding disparities by engaging men allies and by proactively encouraging women and other members of underrepresented groups to achieve their full potential and become visible leaders in their field. We already graduate a higher proportion of female STEM students compared to the national average. 42% of our STEM graduates are women compared to only 36% nationwide. Moreover, studies show that San Diego has outperformed the national average in attracting women to STEM careers. In fact, 2020 represented a historic breakthrough for our region. For the first time ever, women now hold an equal 50% share of the life and physical science jobs in San Diego County. I'm proud of the many strides we have made to improve the representation of women in STEM and leadership positions across our university community. Nevertheless, gender disparities continue to persist here and around the world. It's important that we consistently pay attention to how we are treating women in the workplace 
especially women of color who encounter race-based as well as gender-based biases. Making further progress requires us all to be self-reflective and to contribute to positive change. And this is why my office has recently launched an initiative to promote collective action on erasing the barriers that create opportunity gaps based on gender and race and other factors. Well, partnering with women colleagues of distinctive backgrounds and life experiences and interests and leadership styles is an especially enjoyable part of my role as EVC. I lean on and learn from and I'm grateful for these colleagues every day. So let me close by expressing appreciation for our esteemed panelists for sharing their stories. I'd also like to thank everyone joining us here today for doing their part to help make UC San Diego a more welcoming and inclusive community where all students and faculty and staff will thrive. Hello, I'm Becky Pettit, Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome to the 2021 Women in Leadership event commemorating the 20th year of Sally Ride Science. This event honors Dr. Sally Ride, the first American woman in space and a former professor of physics here at UC San Diego. Sally captured the nation's imagination as a symbol of possibility and as an example of the ability of women to break barriers and achieve their dreams. Her legacy also includes a devotion to cultivating interest in science, technology, engineering, and math with an emphasis on reaching girls. We are honored to extend her legacy through Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego as we inspire future generations of scholars to get excited about STEM. With Chancellor Kosla's commitment and leadership and through our strategic plan for inclusive excellence, we've made significant progress and we're committed to continuing on our path to full inclusion and greater representation of women in STEM and women in leadership. We hope you are inspired by today's conversation as we hear from an esteemed group of women who are leaders in their own fields, who are also examples of excellence and perseverance as they give us a glimpse into the power of inclusion and representation. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the program. Hello, I'm Tam O'Shaughnessy. I'm co-founder and executive director of Sally Ride Science at UC San Diego. After retiring from NASA, Sally was a physics professor at UC San Diego. And today the university carries on her legacy. In 2001, Sally and I, along with our friends, Karen Flammer, Terry McEntee, and Alan Lopes, started Sally Ride Science to encourage girls and boys from all backgrounds to become literate in math and science and to inspire them to envision themselves as scientists and engineers. Here's how Sally expressed our mission. Everywhere I go, I meet girls and boys who want to be astronauts and explore space. Or they love the ocean and want to be oceanographers. Or they love animals and want to be zoologists. Or they love designing things and want to be engineers. I want to see the same stars in their eyes in 10 years and know they are on their way. Amazingly, this is our 20th anniversary. Sally Ride Science is a thriving part of UC San Diego Extension with exciting programs, virtual for right now, like our Summer Junior Academy, professional development for teachers, annual women in leadership conversation, and much more. Women in Leadership celebrate Sally's life by reflecting on the things she cared about most. Sally was an athlete, a physicist, a science writer, a space pioneer, and a champion of excellent and equitable education for all students. And in each of these areas, Sally was a leader. Our panelists and moderator are leaders from diverse backgrounds who will share valuable perspectives on how we can inspire girls to become leaders and empower women to help lead our country to a brighter future. So let's celebrate women in leadership and the 20th anniversary of Sally Ride Science. And let's continue working to keep Sally's dream alive. Thank you. First of all, thanks to Tam O'Shaughnessy for doing this. It is such an honor and privilege and so much fun always to have this conversation in honor of Sally and what Sally and Tam created. So thanks for that. 
So, it's 2021. We made it. We survived the global pandemic, not without pain and loss, and a series of reckonings from race to gender to the real meaning of patriotism. But we are here and we're happy to be alive. And now, as one famous novelist wrote at the end of more than 200 pages, now we begin again. We are facing unprecedented challenges from racial inequality to right-wing extremism, from verbal attacks on women in the military to online trolling of female journalists. No ethnicity is safe from the closed mind of bigots. No gender is protected and women as usual are often taking the brunt of it. But we've also seen great gains for women. As a reporter who has covered more years of the women than I can count, I wanna say here and now that 2020 was not only our latest, but perhaps our most significant year of the woman so far. We elected our first ever female vice president. We saw another extraordinary woman help change the electoral map in Georgia, along with a gazillion women who played a leading role in successful voter mobilization efforts. We are enjoying the elevation of large numbers of women, sometimes the majority, in various departments of our new government. And the Me Too movement continues to call powerful men to account. All good news in the face of persistent sexism. The questions we deal with today arise out of this new reality with added and even more critical meaning. How have these turbulent times affected the demands and the urgency of women as leaders? What have we learned from this past year, from all of our past years, that will drive our female leadership? What can we take from our mistakes and our triumphs to get our girls and young women on track? In short, how do we proceed? And I can think of no better way to illustrate our challenge than to show you these three images. First, this brilliant, brilliant, I say, interpretation of the election of Kamala Harris. Call it what you will, hope, dreams, reality, it matters, it inspires. And second, this much earlier picture of the woman in whose name we now gather. Yep, that's our Sally, listening to and laughing with the girls who are our future. Here's another from yet another Sally Ride Science event with yet another fascinated fan. I especially like this one because it shows Sally signing the children's book about Mars that she wrote with Tam and that brings this all much closer to reality. Sally once told her young audience, you and I will both see people set foot on Mars. The people in this room are just the right age to be the first to land. Who knows? It might be one of you and that will be cool. That will be very cool. Sally didn't live to see that, but we will. And it's our job today to help these kids get there and wherever else they want to go as they lead our nation to a better future. And to guide us on that journey, I am joined by a group of extraordinary women. Let me introduce them. Alphabetically, Dr. Brittany Cooper. Brittany Cooper is Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Studies and Africana Studies at Rutgers University and is a widely sought after public speaker at universities throughout the country and an in-demand commentator for radio, podcasts, and television. You've seen her on MSNBC, BET, NPR, PBS, The New York Times, read her in The New York Times, The LA Times, TV Guide, New York Magazine, and on and on. She is a regular contributor at Cosmopolitan.com and co-founder of the Crunk Feminist Collective and blog. Brittany is also author of the award-winning book, Beyond Respectability, The Intellectual Thought of Race Women, and Eloquent Rage, a Black Feminist Discovers Her Superpower. That's Brittany Cooper. Welcome to Brittany. Maria Hinojosa is an award-winning news anchor and reporter who covers America's untold stories and highlights today's critical issues. As anchor and executive producer of the Peabody Award-winning show Latino USA, which is distributed by NPR, and as anchor and executive producer of the PBS show America by the Numbers with Maria Hinojosa, she has informed millions about the changing cultural and political landscape in America and abroad. In April of 2010, Maria took a groundbreaking step, creating the Futuro Media Group, an independent nonprofit producing multimedia journalism to explore and give a critical voice to the diversity of the American experience. 
Futuro Media is committed to telling stories often overlooked by mainstream media. Murray is the author of two books, Raising Raul, Adventures Raising Myself and My Son, and Cruz, Gang Members Talk with Maria Hinojosa. And I have also learned that Maria is a newly elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Welcome to Maria. Dr. Catherine Sullivan has a long career as a distinguished scientist, astronaut, and executive. She was one of the first six women to join the NASA Astronaut Corps in 1978 and holds the distinction of being the first American woman to walk in space. Her submersible dive to the Challenger Deep in June of 2020 made her the first person to both orbit the planet and reach its deepest point, as well as the first woman to dive to full ocean depth. Queen of the vertical, she is. Kathy has held a variety of senior executive positions since leaving NASA, including presidential appointments to the National Science Board and chief scientist, deputy administrator, and administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. She's also already a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, just saying. <laughs> Kathy currently serves on the boards of International Paper, Accenture Federal Services, the National Audubon Society, and Terra Alpha Investments, and is a senior fellow at the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. She's the author of the children's book, To the Stars, and she wrote Handprints on Hubble, an astronaut story of invention. Welcome, Kathy, to you, and welcome to everybody. So let's start with a brief overview from each one of you. I'd like each of you to answer at least one of these questions. You can pick. Here are my questions. First of all, why women? What can we provide that men cannot? And what have little girls and little boys missed by not having women at the top? Brittany, I'm going to start with you on that one. So, you know, I am a feminist, a proud feminist. And I and I didn't know when I became a feminist that patriarchy was real in my own life, that the system of male domination of the idea that men and boys do it better, that they're stronger, that they can lead, that they're definitive, that didn't that didn't immediately resonate for me because the people who ran my life were women, my mother, my grandmother, uh, my mother's sisters, my aunts, those were the folks that I saw uh, holding it down in my very working class Southern Black family as a child. And so it took me a while to realize that one of the reasons these women shouldered so much weight was precisely because of the ways that many men in my life had abdicated particular responsibilities and commitments to community. And so it's always women for me because that's all it's ever been, because those are the people that I could rely on, because I have always understood women to be leaders, to be creative, to be committed, to be proud problem solvers, to be diplomats, uh, and to be fierce advocates for the well-being of entire communities. So now, when I look at the world, one of the things that, that plagues us is very limited ideas of who men get to be and what it means to be leaders. And I think that one of the things that women contribute is the idea that we lead when we do it together, that conversation matters, that taking account of our emotional lives and recognizing that none of us is ever emotionally disconnected from the big decisions that affect our lives. That there's no such thing as logic and rationality sans emotion. Uh, and that doesn't mean that women are more emotional. It means that we are more emotionally intelligent because we are socialized to be. And so I am a girl power girl. I always have been. I am a mama's girl uh, because I trust that things are better when women are at the table. And quite frankly, if there are no women at your table, I'm not coming. Well, I feel as if we could end our conversation right here. That's all anybody <laughs> needs to know. Thank you, Brittany. But, I, but in fact, there's lots more to know. Maria, what about you? What, what, what have we missed by not having women there? Where, why women? Well, I mean... It's kind of the same way that I, I say, if, you're, if your newsroom is not diverse and you're not practicing excellence in journalism, period, and that you can just add the issue of gender right there, um, you're just not practicing excellence in journalism. And us journalists like to be known for being excellent. And so you're not if you're not doing that. So for me, I was thinking, Lynn, about um, I'm, I'm in the middle of finishing um, a young adult, young reader's version of my memoir, Once I Was You. And so I'm thinking a lot about my time as a child. And one of the, 
My mom, who was, we were all born in Mexico. My mom was dealing with kind of hearing feminist thought coming from the University of Chicago, the community where we were living in. But I was witnessing feminism in a different way, which is way back then, way back in the dinosaur era, little girls like me, we couldn't wear pants to school. I mean, this is in Chicago. You know, winter's in Chicago. And little girls were not allowed to wear pants to school. And it was because of the moms and their petitioning and their basically having us wear pants and then a skirt on top day after day after day after day that that ended up changing everything. And so like Brittany, I'm a feminist. I didn't know exactly what that term meant, um, even though I was, you know, um, I was growing up at a time when women were going and burning their bras. That was a statement, right? I'm free. I'm not wearing a bra anymore. When I get to Barnard College and I start taking my women's studies classes and I call up my mom, who by now was working with Latina women survivors of domestic violence. And I was like, ma, ma, it is feminista, ma. You're a feminist. You're a feminist. No, mijita, I'm not. I'm not burning my bras. I don't, no, no, I'm not burning. I said, ma, a feminist is a human being, in this case, a woman who is supporting another woman in making her believe in herself and own her power, period. And you do that every day with the survivors of domestic violence. And so I'm like, Brittany, it's like the company that I created, it's run by women, it's majority women. Um, and it's, and, and as a result, we create an atmosphere that actually produces excellence because of that emotional intelligence that Brittany was sp speaking about. We, uh, we treat each other well, at least we try to. So if you don't have women, you're not having a good time either. You're just not, it's kind of boring. There you go. <laughs> I, I want to make two comments before I move on to Kathy. One is that we were not allowed to wear trousers, pants to work in the early 1970s when I was working at the Associated Press. Um, I used to think it was because it had to do with who wore the pants, um, but we were not allowed. Uh, and the, and the, oh yeah, that it was a big deal when we started being allowed to wear pants to work. And there was one famous judge in a court in New York who would not let a female attorney into the courtroom because she was wearing a pantsuit. Uh, this is the 1970s, so there and you, you go. know, uh, when I listen to y'all, I'm thinking of this. So I was able to wear pants, but I remember in the mid '90s, um, my family's very religious, uh, and so uh, they, women were not allowed to wear pants at church. And so my mother learned of this policy, like the pastor made it an official policy. And so my mother put on a pantsuit and called up the pastor of the church and went to a meeting with him in the middle of the week, you know, and walks into church with a pantsuit and says, I don't agree with your policy, right? Uh, and, <laughs> uh, and so and that was the end of that. Who gets to wear the pants is a huge sort of theme, yeah. There you go. Well, I happen to know that Kathy Sullivan could not be an astronaut if she were not wearing pants because that's all the outfits they had in their <laughs> uniforms when she got there. So Kathy, what about you? Why women and, and surely from what you've seen at NASA and other places, it's made a difference, but why women in general? Well, you know, I, I don't want to back clean up after Brittany and Maria too often because they're, <laughs> Brilliant points and so powerfully put. Um, so I think my comments will probably thread a few of those pieces together. Uh, the point that stands out to me is because there are there are dimensions of leading, dimensions of making progress that are lacking if you don't have women in the conversation and at the table and and fully credentialed, fully accredited, and, you know, their voice fully mattering. I've seen this in so many ways, and both Brittany and Maria touched on this. Uh, our society, gross generalization follows, but by and large, our society reveres one particular style of leadership. It is the macho warrior style of leadership. You see it all around you, and you hear it, you read it uh, in everything from B-School articles onward. The way to get peak performance out of people. Competition is the only way. It is the one right, good, and best way. That's how you get excellence. That is one way uh, to propel people to excellence, spur them by pride or spur them by rousing their anger. It is absolutely positively not the only way. And I would argue, and, and there's 
research to back this up. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it is the best way because I think for many people, uh, you have to judge if you're going to use the competitive model. You have to judge how much pressure, how much stress is really stimulating this person so that you know, all of their circuits are firing brilliantly and how fine, a little too far, you've pushed them towards a fight or flight or a survival instinct. And a lot of their best capability shuts down at that point. So to come at it in a different way, to come at it in, in a style and a manner that, that is more commonly female, feminine, of supportive, of appreciative inquiry, of valuing all voices, of letting everyone complete their sentences. That's a classic line uh, of any, any woman who's led something. You're allowed to complete your sentence. Everyone gets to complete their sentences. We're not competing with each other for who's the loudest or the brashest. It is not presumed that since you weren't brash enough to shout down Brittany or interrupt Maria and jump on the table and win your point, clearly you're not really as strong or as smart as you ought to be to be in my world. All these presumptions that attach to what is simply a preferred style uh, inculcated in our society, you know, the boys' locker room style, the sports trash talking style. Uh, I have seen so many people flourish especially young, early career women, absolutely flourish when they're working in an environment where they don't have to doubt that they belong there. They don't have to doubt that people in the room want to hear them. Uh, they, don't, they start to recognize and feel, I'm not here out of charity, it let her in, she wants to play. I'm here because I bring something and I need to give that something that I have fully, with full voice and with full expression. So you know, we unleash so much more talent, and and with regardless of gender, you unleash so much more creativity when you're allowing people to blossom. I am going to interrupt you just to say, why is that a female trait? Why why are we more capable of that than men? Do you think, or are we? Uh, I think we are intrinsically more that way. I think you and Brittany touched on it. We tend to still be socialized that way towards paying attention to others, being responsive to others, uh, being aware of others, and, and not feeling that diminishes us to be aware of someone else. It enriches us to be aware of people around us. Uh, and, you know, young, young boys, again, in our society, uh, I can think of my, my brother and watching good friends raise some of their sons. You know, he's going to need to be strong and fight his way forward. So that young boy is hearing from an early day, this is what you must be. And you, and, and you take pride in being a warrior and being the alpha in, in have everyone responds to you. You don't need to be reflective of or, or responding to others. It's isolating. It's limiting. Uh, it's... You know, I, I think it's a terribly sad thing to be uh, acculturating our young boys that way and not letting them not letting them be fully human in their own distinct and unique way because they have to fit this you know war, warrior king alpha male role. I interviewed the only um, president who I've interviewed sitting president in office uh, was Michelle Bachelet, the first mm -hmm. female president Chile. in Chile yeah. and um, and, and, and I, she's a medical doctor. This stuck with me. She said, look, people criticize my style because I like to have a lot of people around me and I like to hear what they have to say. And I like to kind of lead in a collective way. And people mistake that for having a lack of leadership or whatever. She said, I'm a medical doctor. If an emergency happens, I'm going to make the decision. I'm going to stand by the decision and it buck stops with me. But if I'm not in an emergency situation, that's how I want to lead. And I was like, bet there's right. not, we are made to feel wrong because we want to hear other people. And I purposely in my, con in my company, what I say is I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. And that's why other people. And to acknowledge the fact that we're not good at everything. And so that means that you need to have people around you. 
Yeah, the other thing that that sort of singular model promotes is this notion of scarcity, right? It promotes the idea that you, not only that there is only a limited way to be or only one who is the best, but also then it limits our ability to see all of the other kinds of ideas. It limits our capacity to be creative. And so that's why my crew started the Crunk Feminist Collective together because you know there was all this pressure with us being first, many of the women that I am in my feminist collective with are first generation women of color black south asian latina and you know to the first, first generation one, uh, first generation americans you mean um first generation to go to college uh first oh. some are first generation americans but some are literally first generation to go to college and so there's all of this pressure when you're the first in your family to be the best and to excel and to beat everyone and to shine and the problem with that is that it's lonely and so what we wanted was people to go with to you know we call it you know one of the technical terms is mentoring to the side so because we've chosen to go together when we face uh, you know, career challenges, we can call each other up and say, how do I navigate this thing? What do I do? And then, you know, if there's like a big opportunity and only one or two people can be chosen, you know, I'm in a wonderful, you know, collective of women who says, we just want somebody that, you know, in the crew to win, because we know that they will be great, even if it's not me, even if it's a thing I wanted. Uh, and that's a much more healthy, sustainable approach uh, than this kind of masculinist, a uh, competition that says only one person can be the best. Indeed, you know, and when, they, they, the, I was just gonna say the concept of safety in numbers is something we'll get back to in a bit. And I wanna to talk to Kathy, a bit, but go ahead, Kathy, whatever now. Yeah, I was gonna offer a quick story from the other point, from a male's point of view, a good friend of mine, an oceanographer, very well established in his field, teddy bear of a guy. I mean, this man should play Santa Claus at every Christmas. He hated, the fighting, shouting, you know, the really combative approach to planning a, an oceanographic cruise, you know, insulting the other person's science, demeaning their equipment, because I want all the ship time and I want to, the ship be doing, should be doing what I want, where I want. And every night while you're out at sea, that happens over again, because today didn't go quite the way you planned, so you have to rethink tomorrow. Another round of combat every single night. John hated this. But he loved, he really felt good and felt proud about the quality of science that came out of it. So he figured that's just what it takes. You have to put up with this to get excellent science. Later in his career, he finally had a chance to go out to sea on an expedition where the chief scientist was a woman. And he tells this story so vividly, it being out at sea the first night and that replan meeting happens and no one's yelling and no one's insulting. And, and they're actually, they're actually listening to each other and you could see them learning from each other and even giving a bit, no, no, Brittany didn't get quite what she could, let's go. Gracious, and about three days in, he realizes he had absolutely never seen such superb science done at sea. But his punchline was really meaningful to me. He said, if you told him before he had that experience, if you had said to him, John, on your next voyage, take Kathy along, but she really hates the shouting, so just don't do the shouting stuff. What he would have felt was, you're asking me to accept a lower standard. You're asking me to do less and to be less. Until he experienced it, he didn't deep, he didn't know or believe that there was another path to excellence and it could look like that. Uh, but that's then how he led as he went on to lead a major academic department. That's a great story. And Kathy, why, uh, it, keep going now. I wanna ask you now, uh, personally, um, what did it take uh, to get you where you are as a woman? What obstacles did you face? Um, who were your mentors or role models that enabled you to get by that? Or were yeah. there no obstacles for you as a woman? Uh, you know, I have to say, I think I had an astonishingly uh, obstacle-free uh, roadway, not completely, but um, certainly many women have overcome far greater and more numerous challenges than I had to do. Uh, the key to me is uh, back to parenting. Uh, I was raised in two parents, an engineer father, a stay-at-home mom who had dreamed of greater things, but you know, life uh, didn't open those doors for her. Um, and I think the key that they gave to me from an early age was real confidence and their 100% backing that I could be interested in anything I was interested in, whether little girls did that stereotypically or not. And if someone else commented, as people sometimes will do, about, oh, you know, that's, wow, interested in that, 
I felt sort of inoculated against those opinions. And, and I had an episode of that in kindergarten. My Christmas list that year featured, I think, nothing but guns, which was not an interest that had anything to do with guns. The, the commercials on Saturday morning television showed these devices moving and doing interesting things. And I, I wanted to know more about how they did that and to see and feel and hear them. Uh, so that's that's why I wanted them. But I remember my, my kindergarten teacher was clearly distressed that this little girl wanted guns. But thanks to my parents, my first reaction was not, oh, I'd done something wrong. It was, she doesn't understand. She doesn't uh, and, understand uh, what the interest is. At, eight, and at age so five, to have that glimmer of, of, found, of confidence and a foundation. And no, I was, I'm perfectly okay at home and I'm, no one gets to edit what I'm interested in. They can have their opinion, but they don't get to edit it and they don't get to stop me. I always say, choose your parents well. And in your case, it <laughs> clearly worked. Um, Maria, what about you? Obviously your mom was, was sort of there without knowing she was a feminist. What obstacles did you face and who were your mentors? Since the book came out, people have asked me like, what was it like to be the first Latina hired at NPR, at CNN, at PBS? You know, what was it? And I remember just like, well, I was really, I had a, I was really happy to have a job. You know, it was a recession. So I was just like, I wasn't thinking like I'm the first, like, like the first thing was I just got a job. I think like Kathy, in some ways, my career, the, I don't know if it's a vibe that I kind of gave off, but it's not to say that I didn't face comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could sit here and talk about the comments, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what people would now say are microaggressions. And I just learned like, psh, 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 you know, they're just, you know, now I know I'm a boxer now. So I understand the weave and the duck, you know, I get it. And I basically kind of live mm -hmm. that way. But mm -hmm. apart from that, because of my family too, my dad was a medical doctor dreamer. He helped to create the cochlear implant. Um, and my mom from being, and didn't graduate high school that ends up being you know, somebody who works with uh, women in domestic violence in Chicago and becomes a national leader on that. So I was just like a fighter. I was just gonna keep on going for whatever it is that I wanted to do. And I wasn't gonna stop. I think that that's, you know, the question is why, where does it come from to just keep on going? And I think like the Kathy, the Brittany, the you, Lynn, you know, cause I would watch you, right? And I'd just be like, check. Cause you know, when I was younger there were no women on television, right? And then you see Lynn Schur and you're like, check that out. Lynn Schur is reporting from Washington. This is interesting. And suddenly, you know, other things start opening up in your mind, but we're just fighters. I think there's something in us that um, we have been luckily, those of us who are here and ideally those of you who are at the conference, right? You already have that. Somebody's already told you, no, 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 listen to that fire, listen to that gut. And I'm just so, I mean, my dear friend, fellow journalist, uh, Farai Jadea um, came up to Harlem one day and she said, Maria, you're a queen of never giving up. And I'm like, I like that. That's good. I like that too. I Brittany, like that. how does you, Brittany, you've told us um, a bit about your family and your upbringing, and clearly you had mentors built right in. How does what they told you compare to what you tell your students or what you tell young girls today? Is there a difference between the advice you got and the advice you're passing on? Um, you know, there is a bit of a difference. Um, for me, I think one of the differences here is because I grew up in a single parent home, I grew up working class, uh, and I was a kid that was pegged as quote unquote gifted and talented very early, which meant that I was moved out of classes with more students of color and I was put into classes with mostly white kids, right? Um, and so I dealt with teachers who were racist and there was never a year pretty much past the fifth grade where my mother didn't have to call a teacher. And this was back in the days of the phone book and we lived in a small town. So she wouldn't always know the teacher's full name. So she would look up everybody under that last name in the phone book until she found the teacher. And then she would call them and give them the what for about whatever modes they were harassing or undermining me in the classroom. And so even though my mother had at that point in her life only finished high school, she became this fierce advocate for me and it was necessary, right? You know, and it was necessary for her to sort of show up and perform like 
I care about my black child uh, in a way that, you know, so even though I didn't always see myself as going to war, there was someone going to war for me. Um, and so I grew up with the sense that you could not make a mistake, that you had to be perfect, that you could not have a bad day, that you could not slip up because your entire future was riding on being absolutely impeccable. Um, and today, one of the things that I see with my students is that they chafe under the pressure of that, under the pressure of being perfect, being excellent. Um, and so I have very high standards, but I try to be a little more gentle, actually. Um, the women in my life didn't have the luxury of being gentle or tender with me. Um, and I didn't have the luxury of sort of being gentle with myself a bit because I felt like my entire life um, and the future of uh, future generations of my family were riding on my ability to sort of become all of the things that the women in my family had not been able to become. Um, but I see the wear and tear of that on our students now. Well, so wait, so I want to interrupt. Uh, yeah. uh, give us an example. What would um, you say to a student at, that's different from what your mom would say to you? Look, so I tell them, take the day off. I tell them, turn the assignment in late. I tell them, um, you know, so I also am known to be a cheerleader for my students. So they come to me for pep talks in which I say to them, you are excellent. You can do it. You know, I know the white boy across the room seems like he knows more than you, but he doesn't. He's performing. You got it. You're good enough. People told me we believe in you and we know you will be successful. But what they didn't say was that I could have a bad day or that if I got into it with a teacher that that was okay it was always swiftly course correct whereas for me you know I sort of say to my students like your perspectives and opinions are valid if you need to take a self-care day please do um burnout is real please make sure that you're attending to the depression that often comes from all of this pressure because I did deal with depression and I dealt with a lot of rage and I didn't know until I was much older well into my 20s that that was was the accumulating result of never having any outlets other than to be a, a damn near perfect child. And so mm -hmm. I, I try to take, I try to just relieve the pressure on my students by simply saying to them, like, even if you didn't get a perfect score on this assignment, your career is not over. If you did not get an A in this class, you can still get into a good graduate program. You can still have an excellent career. You know, go to sleep, take the nap don't pull the all-nighter right get some rest and eat well and then go at it again tomorrow those are not the things that i was told and right you know, and in black communities um when you are a quote unquote a striver when you are one of these ones who sort of pegged as like a beacon in some way then those are not the things people tell you they just tell you to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders and then they applaud you for doing it and that's a little thing that we like to call in popular culture black girl magic uh and it is magic and it is dope but you know it you got to have a healthy balance with all of it it's it, interesting it sounds Larry, like it, it, go one ahead, of the things one of the things that i do well i'm mexican so i have 16 jobs and one of them is that i'm a <laughs> professor at barnard college my alma mater um, and before that at DePaul. And I love hearing you, Brittany, talk about this because most of my students are women, young women. Most of them are also first gen. Most of them are of color. And I take, you know, I'm like st student appreciation day. We love you. You're incredible. You got <laughs> this. Your voice matters. You're powerful. You have privilege. Use it because you got responsibility. You know, like all of this. Yeah because we didn't have a term for any of these things we didn't you know a panic attack what's that you know code switching what's that it was like survive and work and so it is a very different language and it's one of the reasons why i love instagram because i find it very affirming even though all social media is problematic but um <laughs> this 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 thing of women affirming women um especially in academia or in science I mean, I want to hang out with Kathy. I want to get, can we go on like one of the vertical? I don't need to go up, but I want to. <laughs> oh, go to the Antarctic. Go to the Antarctic with her. She's perfect. She promised oh my me God. penguins and icebergs and I got them both. Uh, this is, however, uh, it's wonderful the advice you were both giving. Um, and it segues perfectly into the next segment of our conversation, which is current events and what's going on in the world today. Uh, the pandemic has intensified the existing inequities based on both race and gender. More than 2 million women have left the workforce. Women always suffer the most in a recession, you know that. So as usual, we get hit first and hardest. It's a national emergency. 
how do you see the effects? How has the pandemic affected women's lives and economic status? And how can women recover the ground that they've lost? Kathy, have you, um, have you got some comments on this? Uh, you know, it has absolutely been devastating. Uh, I'm not bearing in any of the really hard stuff myself, so I feel a little odd commenting on this, but you know, all of the women I know that have children of any age, uh, their kids are back at home. Uh, and so they're now juggling extra balls on top of caring for the house, more worry about the money, uh, often the, the most acute worries about money in the household uh, rest on, a, on the woman's shoulder. Uh, and just and many of them in my circle do have to continue to hold down a job to make the family work at all. So they get the triple whammy, uh, the no time out for anything, uh, and the greatest level of worry. Now, you know, a good marriage in good marriages, partners are sharing some of that uh, and taking care of each other. But I can see the extra strain. Talk specifically, Kathy, about what's happening in the STEM fields, because my understanding is that a lot of women in STEM, in the science, technology, uh, yep. what's the rest of it, uh, engineering, engineering, mathematics, and, math. uh, and those fields that women were already struggling, and because of the pandemic and the responsibilities at home, yep. they're not getting those papers done, and they're not getting the appointments. Well, and, and the impact on academia has, has only compounded that, so any woman who's on a a STEM career path in academia, whether that's as an undergrad or graduate student or early stage professor, uh, that whole world has crumbled on you, right? The economic model of the universities is challenged. Uh, the only good bit of good news for STEM folks is those are not the first departments that universities are looking at as they try to slash costs and keep the boat afloat because they recognize the employment potential and the economic value to students. Uh, and they need the research grant uh, income that can come from, from those fields. But still, you, you know, carrying a course load, teaching undergraduates, getting your lab work done or your field work done so that you can publish. Uh, the publishing cycle is unrelenting when you're trying to establish yourself as a career in academia. And I think, you know, We've talked a lot in the STEM fields about needing some degrees, some educational attainment levels that are between a, a, an undergraduate degree and a PhD. Not every job in the world that will benefit from your STEM expertise requires a PhD in a science field. Uh, the, the habits of mind, the habits of inquiry, the powers of observation that you develop working in the sciences, those are hugely applicable in every walk of life. So the value to getting those skills and building those muscles is huge, but how do we give you a, a better on-ramp into law or public policy or into other sections of business where you're maybe not quite polished enough and your, your social and business and organizational skills not yet developed when you finish your bachelor's degree, but you don't need a PhD. So we're losing, I really worry about the women who've made it through a baccalaureate degree and were trying to go for a master's or an advanced degree in the sciences, which coincides with their starting family years and all of that compounding, it, it's a massive flight of that talent away so from the pipeline. So it's, so it's women in general, it's the pandemic, it's women in STEM and Brittany, of course, it's women yeah. of color. Uh, Black Lives Matter movement, the 1619 Project, have spurred a welcome wider reckoning um, on the inequalities faced by so many people of color in this country. What are the special challenges faced by women of color and are there signs of progress, do you think? Um, so, so many challenges, but I think, you know, I think much to be excited about. I think we can understand what happened over this last year as, as others have called it a she session. There was a report in December that all of the jobs that we lost in December were basically jobs from women of color, right? When you compared them, you know, net, the sort of net loss was all women of color jobs. And in part, it's because women of color are disproportionately represented on the front lines of caretaking work. Um, so women of color were disproportionately sort of affected by COVID because they were they are frontline workers right um 
And also then, it's also that thing too that we call in feminist thought, uh, the second shift, right? You go to work all day and then you come home and you do another shift of work. You're doing homework, bath time, schooling, uh, and taking care of your partner, right? And that's whatever partner configuration you have, you know, women and femme identified folks still do more of the emotional labor within homes. They still do more of the housework, right? Um, and most of our economy is driven by two parent households across the race spectrum. And so women also contribute a great degree of economic value uh, to families. And so when they are pushed out of the labor market, because they've got to go home and, you know, do homeschooling and take care of little kids, um, then that affects everyone. And I think for women of color, we have a few different challenges. It's not just the sort of economic challenges that beset us all. It's also thinking about um, it's thinking about questions of police violence. So it, there's a different thing when you're a mother of color and you got to send your kid out of the house, right? So I'm not just thinking about what happened to Micaiah Bryant in Columbus, Ohio or, uh, last week. I'm also thinking about Adam Toledo, a 13 year old Latino, Latino kid in Chicago who was killed by the cops too. Across the, you know, across the people of color spectrum, parenting little kids of color is a totally different ball game even than parenting white children. Um, and we've got to think too about the toll that this time out of school has taken on kids. Who is going to do the emotional labor to help kids reacclimate? That's going to be another thing that women are called on to do. Um, and, 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 you know, and when I think about progress, one of the things I'm most excited about is like since 2017, women have been in the streets collectively saying, this is not the way we want the country to go. Now it's mostly been women of color. Stacey Abrams is, you know, is, is my absolute most favorite politician in the game right now um, because she has a vision, because she's fighting for us, because she is invested in democracy and we live in a country that like, is really, really relies on women of color to sort of save our democracy, right? To do the right thing. And, and one of the challenges that I face as a black woman and as a fierce feminist who is like, you know, you know, in line with our namesake today, ride Sally ride, like girl power all the way. <laughs> I believe that. And at the same time, I'm sometimes like, what do, what do we as women of color do with white women? Because sometimes we can't trust white women, right? Sometimes the political choices white women make, sometimes the ways they're in league with white supremacy, sometimes the ways that we relate to each other in the work, workplace are not about feminist solidarity. And those are the hard conversations to have, that my womanhood is not like white women's white womanhood. And so there's a way in which I like to say, dudes are terrible. Like, you can't trust them. You know, let me just have a girl power moment. Like, you can't always trust dudes, you know what I mean? they'll throw you under the bus and so we need each other but we also have to remain clear that we need each other to be together and that we got to be able to hear the differences in our struggles i also try to do this as a straight woman to be a good ally to my queer you know to my queer sister and right to be like look you know, we don't need all of this hetero stuff everywhere all the time. What does it mean to support queer women, you know, in the workplace? What does it mean to support them in struggle? And so we all got to be real clear about how to do feminist solidarity with a level of complexity. And if what we said was true at the beginning of this conversation, which is that women get around the table and we work it out and we don't have to yell at each other. We just have to have the tough conversations. Then we got to be able to have it about race, about sexuality, about class. And then I think things will be better. Brittany, let me ask you, how much difference um, does, it, does it make, did it make to have Kamala Harris as vice president? How much difference does it make, will it make to have Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill? Do these things make a difference, do you think? Well, first of all, let me be clear that I've been insufferable because I'm a Howard University alum and all of us have been insufferable <laughs> about Kamala Harris. And so I am mega proud of her. Um, I do think it makes a difference. I spent a lot of the year being angry at the sexism and the way that she was judged, right? Held to different standards than the men, um, you know, to, you know, had to be excellent, had to be perfect, you know, in her record, right? Um, in ways that, you know, little little things that could be handed to us from the dudes and we would give them cookies and for her it was like well it wasn't perfect she didn't do everything we wanted in this issue or that issue and so we don't trust her um i think that she deserves the benefit of the doubt and i the thing i think is black women were brought to this country as property and now a black woman is elected to national federal office 
Of course it matters, right? We lived in a country that said we weren't human, that said that all we could do was reproduce enslaved people. And now we get to make choices about the livelihoods of people. That matters, absolutely. Um, I have I have written and said that I'm less enthused about having Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. Um, I think representation matters. Um, but I want good kinds of representation. I want black women in leadership roles. The, the thing that bothers me about Harriet Tubman, I know more people will come to know who she is, but I also know Harriet Tubman, enslaved people were treated as legal tender. They were treated as like, if you had a debt, you could just sell an enslaved person. So the idea that now we would put a formerly enslaved person on money feels <laughs> uncomfortable to me. You know what I mean? But look, what I what I will say though is that black people do not agree about this, and we don't okay. all need the same things. And so I get that it that it is going to make a historical difference that a black woman will be on legal tender. Absolutely. This is this is a subtlety I had not considered, and I guarantee you the U.S. Treasury, which thinks about nothing, did not consider. Um, Sally Ride used to say, like her her friend and mentor, Billie Jean King, uh, if you can see one, you can be one. Maria, how does that work in the Latina community? Does seeing one being one, and are there enough um, Hispanic women out there for young women, for girls to have role models? Well, the problem is, is that what we've just survived over the last, yes, it intensified under the last administration, but essentially if you're Latino or Latina in the United States of America, um, you are feeling particularly attacked. Um, and so there's the question of invisibility, but now there's a hyper visibility, except that now we all have to respond and to tear down an image that has been built up through um, propaganda and a media that is not representative. And so now we have to say, wait, well, actually Latinos and Latinas are extraordinarily important in terms of business, in terms of education. And it's like, no, wait, wait, aren't you all gang members who are at the border trying to get in? And now we have to deconstruct that. You know, the truth, the data is, is that the most important consumer in the United States of America is Latina. I don't know if any of you knew that. As per Nielsen and the data work research that they do, Latina women over index in terms of black women and white women for being the ones who decide what is purchased in a home. So we decide the paper towels, the detergent, the books, mm -hmm the movies, mm -hmm. the TV shows. And this is an extraordinary amount of consumer power. You know, when I say this to my students, Brittany, they're just like, I don't care. I'm an anti-capitalist. So, you know, it's just like, I don't care if it, it's like, I understand that. But within the context of this uh, structure that we're living in, there is power in what you have in that consumer power. Imagine if Latina women all decided to boycott something. It would be the end of Tide or whatever it is, you know, whatever product. Yep. So um, for us, it's invisibility, now hyper visibility and tearing it down to actually be more truthful in representation. And it's a lot of work. There are, I think here's the critique that I'll make about um, Kamala. Like, I think if Kamala had it to herself, there would be a different conversation specifically on the issue of immigration and refugees. Um, and so I kind of wish that she had, even though she's been charged with taking care of this issue, there has to be a total break in terms of the narrative around immigration, refugees, the fact that they are not all Latinos and Latinas, that there are many black people who are uh, immigrants and refugees and migrants right now that are being held I think if she had her druthers, you know, she might do that thing of like shut down all the detention camps, stop holding children, you know, bring the mothers in. And so I'm looking for, while of course we're thrilled that Kamala is there, I'm part of the team that is going to be pushing and pushing and pushing from out here to, to be even more radical. In your memoir, Once I Was You, you have a very personal um, situation that happened at the border as an immigrant in Mexico. Talk about that a little bit and, and how that affects what you're saying. So um, 
there's a saying in Mexican Spanish, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There is no bad from which good cannot come. Were it not for the last administration and the kind of horror um, that we were kind of exposed to, this wouldn't have all unleashed and I wouldn't understood what actually happened when we arrived in this country with privilege, with green cards, by plane, to meet my father who was at the University of Chicago and in the Dallas airport, because we were Mexican and there was a policy on the books until 1964 to check our bodies to see if we were clean enough. So the immigration agent at the Dallas airport sees that I had a rash and says to my mom, oh, you can go ahead to Chicago. We're going to keep her, me. And this, um, when this all comes, literally, it's just kind of in the process of writing the book and this conversation with my mom and the hearing the voices of the children crying who were held in these cages, this all comes tumbling out. And it affects me, Lynn, because I realized why I do what I do. Um, so the trauma that is, you know, the survival of Brittany and the trauma of being a Black woman legacy in this country, or the trauma of being uh, arriving to this country and because you are Mexican and different, you are take, almost taken away from your mother. It's like so you, you weren't feel you were it. not you were not taken I was away. Not. From your mother. No, my mother. Oh my God, no! My mother, all five feet tall, started screaming. In full, you know, she had all four of us kids screaming and using her privilege. The only thing she said, you call the president of the University of Chicago and you ask him. I mean, she literally created a scene. And when I asked her, I thought it was a feminist moment back when she was like, it wasn't feminism. It was trauma. It was trauma. So that's the kind of thing that the, the young women who are watching us, you may have this in your life, but you can understand that you use it and you flip it and you make it your superpower, your survival power. Yeah, so it's so it's black girl magic and it's that kind of superpower. And Brittany, I wanna let you say whatever it is you wanted to say to Maria, but while you're doing it, consider this, please. In your book, Eloquent Rage, yeah. you write about anger as a black feminist superpower. And based on what Maria just said, and in your experience, how does anger help and how can it hurt? Yeah, um, the thing I wanted to say is, Kamala is the child of immigrants. She is the daughter of immigrants. And so I think that means she has a moral responsibility to actually get this right. Um, Reach. And, and, and the challenge that so many of us face is, you know, when we are in these positions, what do you do? Look, I don't agree with Kamala on everything. And so, you know, in the primaries, I didn't support Kamala. And then folks said, how dare you as a black woman not support this first black woman? You know, cause I wanted someone who was more to the left. And then when she won, I also felt intense pride because I know what it means for a black girl to get over the finish line. And so one of the things that I'm also trying to say today is that we are not here to sell you this narrative that it's all kumbaya when you have a bunch of women at the table. We disagree. We disagree agree intensely. Um, we don't all ally just because we have shared identities. And so we both, you know, have like, so I have com political commitments that are more like Maria's, right? Why are we terrorizing people at the border? Ethically, we must stop doing that. And also understanding that a black woman has been put in a position where she isn't the primary decision maker. So, so her job is to make our, our president Though he has done a pretty good job thus far, he is still an old white man who's fairly centrist. And this black woman has been put in a position where she is to make him win. And when you are in a woman in these position, high profile positions, you're often in these really terrible positions. And so we have to figure out how to be in solidarity with that challenge and also push you to show up and do the job you are there to do. And part of what that means is remembering what your purpose is in the institution. That is one of the things that I try to remind myself is not what are other people's goals or projects, but what is the work that I am there, given my history, my own journey to do? Who am I there to make something easier for? It's why I teach in the ways that I do. And one of the things that clarifies that for me are the things that make me angry. So I have been enraged about the killing of George Floyd. I have been enraged that a black girl named Darnella Frazier is the reason that we were able to procure a conviction in the Derek Chauvin trial, right? Because there's a traumatized black girl who was forced into a position of seeing mm -hmm. law enforcement not do their jobs that day. Um, 
I am enraged about what happened to Micaiah Bryan in Columbus, Ohio. I'm enraged about how women are treated across the board, that we're terrorizing young women and girls at the border, right? Um, that we are, you know, literally there was an official there at the end of the Trump administration who was recording when young women started their menstrual cycles and keeping track of that. What, why is that? That's unacceptable, right? Um, when we are clear about what we're angry about, we are clear about where injustice lies. And I think the things that enrage us tell us something about the kind of work we're supposed to do in the world and what kind of causes we're supposed to be fighting for. And one of the reasons that I tried to own my anger is because people love to call black women angry black women, but any woman knows that moment when you're sitting around the table with men and they call you emotional. You show <laughs> a little bit of personality and they say, calm down. Relax. It makes me want to fight people. You know what I mean? All women have experienced that moment. Um, and the reason that I try to own my anger and my rage um, is simply to say it is not destructive. It doesn't mean that I'm unclear. It means that I'm quite clear, in fact. And I try to use that rage as a power to build the world that I want to see. I grew up sometimes seeing men in particular not use rage particularly productively, but I don't believe the lie that angry women are untrustworthy. I believe those are the chicks that change the world, and I'm trying to be one of them. <laughs> You know what I do in that point around 2015, when I was angry at so many things, also lost my father, my best friend, my cousin died in the same six month period. I started boxing and I box uh, four or five times a week. Um, and I think it really is something in terms of our rage. There's nothing like it. Um, someone recently asked me, what are you thinking about when you're boxing? And I'm like, well, first I'm not thinking, which is the good thing, right? So I'm giving the brain. And then I'm thinking about my technique, which is like really silly because I've never watched a boxing match because I actually hate boxing matches and I'm never going to actually hit anybody. But it feels good to know that if I had to, <laughs> you could do it. But so what the theme the theme that comes out of so much of the, uh, what we're all talking about, and, and you've said it specifically, is also the togetherness, the idea of working together. And Kathy, um, you've had a huge amount of experience with teamwork, um, not only with other women, but with other men. Um, I, I want to ask about um, your first mission was the joint mission with Sally. Yes. Um, Kathy's first shuttle mission um, was the first mission with two women, two American women, two women going into space together. And I wanna, I wanna ask you about safety and numbers. And I wanna ask you um, if that made it any easier uh, at that point to fly. Sally at that point, of course, was the world's most famous person. And here comes Kathy and tell your little joke about what you did too. Yeah. it. Um... And I think you know, we've touched on this along the way. It, there's, there's, there's not magic fairy dust here just because you put several women together. It can help in a safety in numbers, but that depends on how you come together, whether you come together. Uh, and you know, Sally was a very, very private and a very, very competitive person. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm up for my first space flight. I'm, you know, I'm, pr I'm proud to have been tapped. I get to go fly. I get to do a spacewalk. I'm. You know, I'm kind of feeling pretty good about this, uh, but I'm now, you know, alongside the most famous person in the world, uh, and, and she's still getting a lot of media attention. We're getting a lot of media attention, and I began to feel like the only reason anybody wanted to talk to me from the media was because I might know where Sally was. Except uh, for so me. My, you know, for, except yeah, for my me. Only, except for you. <laughs> my only my only value was to vector them towards Sally, and you know that. That wounded my pride. I, you're not happy about that. It's always that combination of pride and insecurity, right? They go hand in hand. So at one point, just to sort of make the joke overt, uh, I took the name tag that we would wear on our flight suits. You usually just had your name embossed on it in some silver or gold letters. And I had one made that said in large letters, said Sally. But then I had them emboss a bar, a line a, across the top of that word, which is a play on a, an approach to algebraic formulation, Boolean algebra. So if you're doing logic, you say this, this and that, or this and not that. 
Well, you write and in all caps, this and that. And if you mean not and, you put a bar over that. That's how you symbolically show that I meant, I didn't mean or, I meant nor. I didn't mean and, I meant nand. And so I walked around for a fair number of days with this name tag that essentially said, not Sally, because it felt at that point like, it seems to be all I am at the moment is not Sally. Sally was not amused to say to say the least. Um, uh, but you know, I, I mean, Sally was. Uh, I think we were we were friends in the sense of people in a group team together doing something together, but uh, not friends in any other deeper way. There's still a competitive dynamic. I don't know how much it was, you know, Sally wanting to stay on the top pedestal media wise, or you know, not not liking someone creeping into her spotlight. I don't really know. She wasn't the kind of person you would open that conversation with. Uh, but there were a number of points along the way training for that flight uh, where I actually felt like she was she was poking at me. She was prodding at me. She was trying to spur me to best performance, maybe. Uh, trying to undermine me, shake my confidence, see if I could take it, maybe. Not clear. Uh, but there was not some, you know, golden era of Brittany like you've been saying, uh, when we had technical things on the mission, we got around and we solved the technical things. But in terms of, you know, did it help me to have as a person, as a woman doing my big first thing, did it help that another woman was there? Uh, it was something between made no difference at all and, and was a, a bit of a problem. Uh, but, you know, I want to loop back just for a second to that uh, Billie Jean King's statement and now commonly cast as if you can't see it, you can't be it. I take the point that's intended that if I can see someone who I feel a sense of resonance with doing something, it, it can help shore up my confidence. It, it helps to have a positive image in your mind's eye. But if that were really, really true, no human being would ever have done something for the first time. And so I don't wanna plant in our young people and in our young girls that the arch notion of that. If you if they're not enough black women doing something for you to see, then then sweetheart, I guess you just can't do that. Sweetheart, you go be the one that breaks that door down first. You can do that. And someone has to. And the timing might just mean that it is you that gets to crack that door for the first time. Plenty will come in after you. But I mean, by all means, find people around you who can inspire you. You know, take take lessons from everyone. I mean, what have I learned about courage from Nelson Mandela? He's he's male and black. I'm not either of those things. You mean I can't learn anything about courage from him, or eloquence from Maya Angelou because our skin color is different? I mean, that is absolute nonsense. So, I tend to go through life thinking every person I bump into is a momentary mentor. There's something in them of deep and abiding value that I can take with me. And sometimes it's a, 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 I don't wanna be like that lesson, but more often than not, it's a really wonderful nugget that I tuck inside and it's like, it's a radioactive nugget. It keeps giving off energy uh, that adds to, to all my other energies. And, and at some point in the future, it will pop to mind as the thing I needed to know at that moment from that person way back when. So I'm much more a fan of momentary mentors than of formal uh, office hour kind of mentorships. Yeah, it reminds me of two things. One, um, Stacey Abrams, when I interviewed her a couple of years ago, um, you know, she said that one of the things her mother told her about her run for governor was somebody has to be first. And I, and that's the thing that I hear from you. Somebody has to be first. And so don't shrink back from being first. Also, I just want to say that I love that you're a tennis fan because I love tennis <laughs> and, you know, and I take, and so really quite frankly, my like internal person that I'm always trying to be is some combination of Venus and Serena, right? Like I'm trying to have that sort of <laughs> precision in the power, right? And then that kind of finesse that Serena has, and then the finesse that Venus has. And when I think about them, you know, and I think about the work that they did with Billie Jean King to make tennis more, you know, to create gender parity within tennis, particularly Venus, right? Um, but also they are my reminder when I think about like folks who inspire me, 
Those are women who came into the game of tennis and changed how it is played across the board, changed the right. standards, changed the level of athleticism, right? Um, and don't always get credit for it. And so it's not just that women collaborate differently. Sometimes we actually elevate the quality of the science, right. the quality of how the game is played because we're there and because we're in the room. Um, and, and we don't always get the credit for it, but that doesn't mean that there's not, a, you know, an immediate impact from what it means for us to show up and therefore to show up and to not play small, right? Right. To show up and to not make it easy for other people, you know, uh, you know, don't apologize because you're great and you therefore force other people to be great. You don't know what you might mean to someone else that's watching you. So don't pull that punch. Don't edit yourself. We're going to do this really quickly now. I need really very, very brief answers. And since Brittany brought up tennis, I'm going to go to that very quickly first. Sally Ride was, of course, well, best known as an astronaut, a scientist. She was also, as a youngster, uh, on the professional circuit. Um, uh, I know for a fact that one of the reasons she was chosen at NASA to be an astronaut was because she also had the hand-eye coordination and they loved the tennis thing. My point being, you need something other than your main thing to make it. Very quickly, what is it besides what you do on, on a daily, uh, in real life, what is it that makes you who you are? I'm just going to go around quickly for this one. Brittany. Cooking. Cooking. Kathy. Dogs. Dogs. Okay. Maria. Uh, I call myself a succulentologist. Okay. Plants. <laughs> Cactus kind Plants. of things. So, okay, yes. cool. Love that. Okay, very quickly. What's the best thing parents can do to encourage young girls today? Maria, starting with you. Uh, give them a lot of love first. To me, love is essential. Encouragement and continue to tell them, dream big, dream, 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 dream big. And we got you, we got you, we got you, we got you. Kathy, how about you? Take them with you when they're younger than you think and let them be your partner in building answers and doing things in creating. Let them be with you watching and doing with you from planning a vacation to planning the meal to solving a problem. You're starting to flex their muscles and give them knowledge that they can do something. Brittany, what can parents tell their kids, their girls? Look, trust, trust little girls. Um, when I was seven, I was a Girl Scout and I was selling cookies. My mother took the cookie sheet with her to the office to sell for me. And one of her coworkers, uh, her bosses, a white man said to her, I will only buy them if she comes into this office and sells them to me. So my mother brought me into work and I had to pitch those cookies. And after I did it, and he was a tall, big man, but I took my little seven-year-old self in there and asked him to buy those cookies. And he told my mother, she will be just fine and she will do anything she wants to do don't <laughs> rob your kids of opportunities to lead to sell and to be confident they can do it okay everybody speculate fantasize what if women ran the world or maybe just one government or maybe just science labs speculate who wants to start i'll start with the labs because the other ones are above my capacity <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if women ran universities and labs, uh, it would be absolutely possible for any woman uh, in her 20s, 30s to both start the building of a successful family and continue building a top-notch career. It would be woven into the fabric that these things are both possible and happen at the same time. And there would be support mechanisms to assist with that, the advancement promotion steps to go through would be cognizant of that, uh, not and, and not just cognizant of it for women like, well, we'll let you have a different path. But uh, it would be the norm that everyone can have life and family and career building in their 20s and 30s. Exciting possibility. Would you want to work there? I'd, I'd be much more likely to work there than in any other university lab I ever saw. Because that, and would you that run, was would you run that it? was uh, I I could run it, but you know that was that was part of my equation. I w I want to be able to be all of me. It was a piece of my equation for moving on from NASA. Uh, there was a, kind of a certain mold and style and manner uh, of you know, fitting into those crews and those teams, which I could do, and it was fabulous. 
but it was at the it was like playing 48 keys on the on my keyboard instead of all 88 keys uh, it was worth doing it for those years, but I was not going to live my whole life not playing all 88 keys. Brittany, speculate. What if women ran the world or your university or you pick the organization that they're going to run? Look, if progressive women ran the world, because it's some, it's some women that I don't trust, but if progressive ah. women... <laughs> If progressive women ran the world, you know, we would have handled COVID like Jacinda Ardern did in New Zealand. We would uh, have uh, free childcare for everyone, right? Um, trans kids could get medical care. Um, and, you know, and I think that, quite frankly, I think we'd actually have less war. I, I think we would. I think we would not engage in the politics of global destruction. Um, and so, uh, that's my hope and wish. Maria, women running what? Oh, well, you know, I'm about to tell you. It's about to be. <laughs> we have to run all of the media institutions, all of the journalism. And I'm going to take Brittany and and go one further or up it. I don't know. I don't play boker, but whatever it is. <laughs> um, I actually want women of color yeah. to run America's news media. Yeah. I want us to be the ones where the buck stops. Yeah. One, because we're excellent journalists, period. We're excellent American journalists, period. But two, because I think it's time for this country to see the world through a different perspective. And I think it would change everything, not immediately, but ultimately everything I think is what it would change. Love that. There's a newsroom yeah. I would work in. <laughs> I love okay, that. Um, I do have one more. I'm going to throw one more in. It is sort of an afterthought, but um, haven't we always been an afterthought to them? Advice <laughs> for men and boys. What can they do to help our girls and young women get ahead and run America's newsrooms and science labs and universities and you name it? Be a good collaborator. I'm thinking of, of colleagues of mine who work with me, who are men, some of them who are white men, who work in a woman-run uh, media institution. They are good colleagues. They listen. They bring their whole selves and their ideas. So they're not censoring themselves because we don't want that. But they listen and they watch that ego. Uh, that ego is something that they have to learn. And it's very hard when, you wait, when you're raised in patriarchy, but, but they, can, they can try. They can try and do it. Brittany? I want men to stop getting the language right without doing the emotional work. I want y'all to really make sense of what it means if you're not the primary person in the room, if you are not the leader, because we have too many stories of men who outwardly supported feminist causes while secretly sexually abusing uh, and harassing women. That So it isn't just enough to say the right things. It isn't just enough to give your money to the right causes. It isn't just enough to hire women. You have also got to actually be a better man. You have got to undo Undo your investment in patriarchy, undo your investment in being a leader. And one of the key ways you can do that, every dude needs good homegirls. Get you a, every, look, everybody need a black homegirl. Everybody does. But get you some women friends that you don't want to have sex with <laughs> and that you just like to listen to them and understand what they think. Because if you do that, all the men in my life who have substantive relationships with women that they are not sleeping with are men that you can trust to actually be good allies. And that is an everyday regular step that you can take that isn't about what you read in a book, isn't about what you said politically, but is about your day-to-day -day practice of actually showing up for and being a good ally to women. And you, you grew up in a big family. What can a brother do for a sister? <laughs> I need black men to stop taking up all the political space in the room. We are in this together. And if you truly want black people to be free, then you got to ride for black women and girls to be free. Okay, Kathy, how about a real brother to a real sister? <laughs> uh, you know, have, have your back, support you, help propel you forward in those little micro steps as, as, your, as your youngest selves that, that set your ground, that, give you those first doses of confidence. But you know, more broadly in just a metaphorical way, I think of getting at what, what both Maria and Brittany have said, have the courage to break out of your turtle shell. 
you know, the, the turtle shell mindset, uh, persona, the, the macho, the, the presumptions that come with your having become accustomed to always, always being heard, always being regarded, always being listened to, always being obeyed, always being first. Have the courage to break out of that shell a little bit and see what the world is like uh, as a full up human being in relationship to other full human beings. Yeah. Oh, wonderful advice. And um, heaven knows we've all made mistakes. Heaven knows we've done some things wrong, but um, with advice like this, um, momentary mentors, um, all sorts of things. I think the, the, the young girls, um, the young women, the girls, even the little boys who are watching uh, can get a lot out of this and, and make the world a better place. And um, I keep thinking back to what Sally said to that group of youngsters that she addressed and told them that one of them would get to Mars. It turns out one of them is going to get to Mars and pretty soon. Kathy, you want to give us a, a quick insight on what, when, when are we getting to Mars? Oh, well, the first question is, what do you mean we pale face? Because it's an interesting, <laughs> or interesting era with so many yeah. countries really at least saying and announcing very bold goals. Um, I, don't, I don't think it will be before 2030. Uh, I think it's quite possible, maybe even likely, it'll be a multinational mission. Uh, and there's a fair chance it will be a different kind of commercial uh, participation and not just a government contracting for the vehicle, but but possibly actually a, a corporate push uh, along the lines of SpaceX or Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. So it's it's going to be a, a wild a wild ride for a decade in space with lots of new moving parts and lots of new players. I mean, look at look at Mars right now. There's a spacecraft orbiting Mars from the United Arab Emirates, who I, I suspect many people would not top of mind put at the top of the right. space very nations list, but they're at Mars. Well. And maybe once we get to Mars, we'll do it right with lots more women. Um, on behalf of Tam O'Shaughnessy, on behalf of the late Sally Ride and Sally Ride Science, thank you all for an extraordinary conversation. I think we could go for another three days and still not cover everything. <laughs> and I hope everybody out there listens to every single thing you said because it's all important. So thanks to you. Um, thanks to our wonderful audience. And see you next time. Bye-bye.